Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce a man that I have known for a year now and have grown to admire and love, and I know you will enjoy hearing from him. He's going to chair this meeting, John, one of our alcoholic trustees. Hi. This opportunity of chairing this meeting because this has been a phase of AA concern which has been very close to my own heart. When I returned from the service in 1946, 1945, I was invited to become public relations man for St. Luke's Hospital in Philadelphia. I didn't realize the reason behind this until a few months later when I discovered that Dr. Saul, who was the medical director of the hospital and my personal physician, the man who started me off on my own sobriety program, had been planning a clinic for alcoholics at that institution. We opened it in June of 1946, and for a number of years, I was the administrator in charge and served as what we call, I don't like the term, but I don't know a better one to describe the work in a hospital, a lay therapist. I counseled with the alcoholics who came through our clinic, and in the course of that experience, I expect I was in touch with between 12 and 15,000 men and women suffering from the acute stages of alcoholism. We were not an AA clinic in the sense that AA was not responsible for our work there, nor did it have the sole right of admission. We did receive anybody, however, whom AA brought to us. AA had free access to visit. We had an AA group which met readily down the hall where patients could attend even in their bathrobes, and it was the closest relationship throughout. And so I'm delighted that at this 25th anniversary, we're going to have a chance to consider together the question of AA and hospitals. As is about everything else that you raise in AA, there are at least two opinions about AA and hospitals. There are those, particularly some of the older members and perhaps some of the ones who were most severely depleted and run down, who shook themselves out of their alcoholism unaided, who say, in effect, I shook myself out of it, let these guys shake themselves out too. There are those, however, and I think their number who is, in, is increasing, who are coming to believe that there is a distinct and necessary place for medical therapy, particularly in the acute stages in which many alcoholics find themselves. I am not a believer in suffering for the sake of suffering. I believe that it is our responsibility as human beings to alleviate human suffering in any possible way we can. Certainly all of us who have been through the acute stages of alcoholism know that there is no experience more painful physically, emotionally, and spiritually than the withdrawal symptoms, to use the medical terminology, which follows our last drink. Anything we can do, therefore, to release, to relieve human suffering, to make it easier for alcoholics to recover their minds, the reason which God gave them, to become susceptible, amenable to receiving the message which we in AA have to bring meets with my own hearty endorsement. I'm not going to discuss this further. We have, as you see from your programs, a distinguished panel of experts in this field. To the list of those printed on your program, I want you to add the name of Dr. I.J. Brightman, who is Assistant Commissioner for Chronic Disease Services of the New York State Department of Health, whose name through a tragic inadvertence was omitted. Very happily, I was actually able to show Dr. Brightman the apology published in our newspaper today before he'd had, as he said, even had a chance to gripe about it. <laughs> this is tenth step work with a vengeance, my friends. <laughs> we admitted we were wrong before the guy even knew it. Our first speaker this afternoon is, as you see, Colonel Edward B. Towns, who has succeeded to the management of his family's concern, the Towns Hospital in New York City. He and I were talking at lunch, thinking that there ought to be perhaps a plaque 
placed in the hospital because this is where it all began. However, I suppose we'll never be able to do this because we are, after all, anonymous. But we in AA shall be eternally indebted to Towns Hospital and its staff and its ownership for what began there 25 years ago. And now I know you're eager to hear Colonel Towns. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Doctors, and ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether I am privileged as a non-alcoholic speaker to say hi, Ed, but I'm going to say it just the same. <laughs> hi, Ed. It's all right, boy. I want to preface my remarks here by stating that I speak only for Towns Hospital, which is a private proprietary hospital, and the opinions I voice are strictly our own, although they have been tested uh, over a period of almost 60 years. The founding of the hospital, I think in its way, is just as remarkable, if not fantastic, as the spiritual experience of your co-founder in the founding of AA. Because my father was a Georgia boy whose schooling was very seriously curtailed through the efforts of a northern general known as Sherman. <laughs> In fact, not only did he not get higher education, he was lucky to get halfway through the first phase. So when this man was faced with this inspiration, challenge, whatever you wish to call it, at the turn of the century, and embarked without medical knowledge, but with a sense to work with medical people on the treatment of addictions, it was truly a remarkable phenomenon. I think he was the first articulate voice who said that addicts of all classifications are sick people. That was a long time ago. In fact, it's only practically since the last war that, as someone put it, they've taken the alcoholic patients out of the back room of the jail and treated them as sick individuals. I can't go into many of the fascinating historical stages of this, but I've only been active in the hospital for 16 years, but I can assure you old-timers that I can remember when the ladies came in handsome cabs with their ostrich plumes. In fact, my mother admired the hat of Lillian Russell so much, she gave it to her. <laughs> the present hospital was opened at its location in 1914. And with one exception, I think, of my father's only really mistaken judgment, it has been devoted exclusively to the treatment of alcoholism and addictions ever since. And that exception was that he was firmly convinced although he was very much in favor of it, that prohibition would put him out of business. So he installed the facilities of a general hospital, which I can assure you now have not been used in 25 years, and during prohibition he never had it so good. <laughs> and the next historical note, in 1932, by one of those lucky happenstances, he met Dr. Silkworth on the street and asked him where he was going. He said, I don't know. He said, I've just had been in this hospital that failed across town. I'm looking for an office. Whereupon he was escorted into town's hospital and he stayed there till he died. And of course, it was a very wonderful relationship. And the last item of historical interest, which your chairman has already referred to, is the matter of Bill's uh, spiritual experience and his being a patient in the hospital in the fall of 1934. Now let's get to the hospital. We feel, especially with our AA patients, which I will touch on later, that we are sort of at the grassroots of the treatment of alcoholism. Many of these patients, in fact a great percentage of them, are being hospitalized for the first time. It is their first contact. They've asked for help. Their families have asked for help. They are in such condition that hospitalization is necessary, and they are brought to us. We feel a very, very great responsibility, therefore, 
in the reception and treatment of these people. And so that their first experience will be as favorable as we can make it. And therefore, we start with the first premise that we must treat these people not as drunks and to a lesser degree dopes, but as sick people. And the attitude of our staff, medic, nursing, administrative, housekeeping, must be to regard our patients and give them the understanding, because after all, you have been through the mill, many of you know that a patient just coming in is not a fellow walking into a hospital for an appendectomy. He can come, he can come in really in, in rather rare condition. In fact, we had one fellow who was so convinced his horse was an alcoholic, he brought him in too. <laughs> And almost got him on the elevator. The funny aftermath of that was there was a lady whose husband had called us on previous occasions and said, never admit my wife unless I okay it, otherwise you won't get paid. Well, that's quite a stricture that you want to obey. <laughs> so she was waiting in the front office and then trying to back this animal around to get him out. He wanted in the front office and she came too out of this fog with his horse's face about three inches away and she went into hysterics and we quieted her down got her upstairs, and I, it was a hurry call for me, and I had to go up because the boys on the floor had heard nothing about the horse episode and said, look, sister, I've seen purple zebras, <laughs> elephants. Don't worry about horses. That's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it is another finding that was crystallized by Dr. Silkworth in a publication in 1937, and on which we proceed that alcoholism, in his words, was the manifestation of an allergic reaction. Now, I don't, in the presence of my learned colleagues here, attempt to make that statement dogmatic. I do say this, that on two counts, it works extremely well. Those two counts are this. Many an alcoholic has a latent fear that he is a mental case. If you can give him the assurance that his inability to drink liquor as the normal drinker is able to do it, and that that is, whether it's chemical, metabolic, or dietary or otherwise, is a phenomenon that exists in him, you allay a fear. And allaying a fear is a very important thing in proceeding with treatment. It also gives us the right to say to him, once this is established, we have never seen a properly diagnosed case reverse itself. And we hold out no hope to you that you can ever drink normally again. Now, there we're playing fair with him. He may not like the bad news, mind you, but at least there it is. And we base it on that theory. We know there are plenty of fine authorities who are inclined to question it. But after all, we are concerned chiefly with taking the acutely sick alcoholic and restoring him to normal physical functioning as quickly and as benignly as we can do it. We must send him back to his work, to his profession, to whatever his calling is, in good shape. And if we are going to do that, we must confine ourselves primarily to the physical end of the treatment. Years ago, it was a greater problem than it is now because we have an adjunct at this time which can take care of the sobriety therapy, which is going to follow his hospitalization. But our job is a physical one in the first instance. As one side comment, which I think AA has taught us in our, on our medical work and which has been extremely satisfactory to us, when I first joined up some 16 years ago, uh, all alcoholic patients were tapered off. That was the way it was done. That's the way it had always been done. Then Silkworth, who was our medical director, as well as the director of the AA ward in Knickerbocker, said, we're beginning to do it on a dry basis. Well, we shuddered at the thought, but we took one floor and made it dry. Now we have only one floor where the taper offers still insist on their quota before they give up the ghost. <laughs> and you know, there's one interesting reason for that, and I've seen this happen in my time. One reason for that is that years ago, 
A voice would call me on the phone and say, Hi. <laughs> I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. Look, I've got to have a bed next Friday. <laughs> By the time next Friday came, and he came, he had had it. <laughs> Ten years later, the same fella comes up, jumps out of a taxi, bounds up the stoop, and I don't know what he's coming in for, maybe to see about a bill or see a patient or something. What are you doing here? I had two drinks before lunch. And here he is for admission. And then the fun starts. Because his drinking cycle is just the same as it was ten years ago. But he wants to finish it with us, you see. <laughs> And I said, well, why work this on me? He said, here's the furthest I can pull us from the bed to the floor. And I feel safe. I know I'm not going to get clipped. I know I'm not going to get rolled. I'm not going to disgrace the family. So, that's it. Then the fun starts, as I say. Now, I want to change from that subject to our relationship with AA. Of course, we're more than proud of our historical uh, beginning. And that in itself was a remarkable thing, because if you are a hard-boiled administrator, owner of a hospital, I'm referring to my father now, and a very, and a very smart and very unemotional and very much matter-of-fact doctor as Silkworth was, and had a fellow say to you, I have just seen God, the first thing they dash for is a paraldehyde. <laughs> because that... That is, that is really, that is really, uh, that is really a DT symptom which uh, you don't often meet. One fellow congratulated me on a Muzak setup I had which was connected with heaven and God talked with him every day and asked me how much it cost to put in, which naturally didn't exist, and no, no Muzak in the hospital, but, uh, these two men saw it immediately. They were not religious men in the churchly sense. At least I can speak for my own father. I know he wasn't. Yet they saw this thing early. In fact, long before Bill ever went to Akron and met Dr. Bob, he was starting in a, in a uh, very, very ele elemental way his 12-step work in the hospital. He, as he said afterwards, I was wrong the way I did it because I was telling them. See, all the rest of the evolution came afterwards when they worked it out. But we saw it. In fact, my father was one of the first ones who said to him, you've got to put this in a book. Word of mouth is not going to last too much longer. And proceeded to assist him in the not only the writing, but the publication of the book itself. So that is a very, very pleasant memory to look back on. Now, how do we work with AA in the hospital? Well, I might say to start, we work, we work very pleasantly. The intergroup organization in New York is a professional, highly competent, very human, very understanding organization. The present ladies who are in charge there, Doris and Adeline and some of the male volunteers, know exactly what their problems are, and they know what our problems are. But AA has one great advantage in our, my hospital, which I don't say as an advertisement. That is, we have, we're doing the same thing, we're treating the same type of patients long before they came there. We're pinpointed to this work. Our staff is, is organized for this work. They are not mad because they had to take time away from a lung cancer case to let some drunk come in the front door. You see? And they don't sabotage things for that reason. We know that if you're going to, if a, if a, whether an AA sponsor or a family bring a patient in, they want to get him upstairs and get him to bed fast, and so do we. Because if he sits around too long, he knows that just exactly one block away are a flock of bars, and he must have one more before he's admitted. So the faster we can get him up and get him to bed, the faster he's going to be helped. We work on strictly on a sponsor basis, except between the hours of uh, 8 p.m. and 10 a.m. when uh, an AA can bring a patient in, provided, of course, he has not been in the hospital before. He only has one, I mean, in the AA floor before. 
and then we check in within a group in the morning, and then he's cleared as an AA patient. The stay is for five days. They, uh, he has no telephone calls, he has no visitors, he can't see his own doctor, he can't see his own clergyman, he can't see anybody but AA. I might say parenthetically that this causes us more trouble than any other thing because I've yet to see an alcoholic who lands in a hospital in bad condition and hasn't left business and everything else pretty well fouled up. And he's wondering what's happened to his wife. He's wondering what's happened to his business. He wonders if he's got a job. He's got to telephone. That is done through his sponsor. He may not be done as quickly as he wants, but it is done. And we, we would, we would very frankly, when we took all the telephones off the second floor, leaving only one in the nurse's station, we wish we could have done it on the upper floors as well. Because if there's one thing that an alcoholic gets is telephonitis, and he gets it bad. <laughs> On this floor is another excellent AA rule. The ladies and the gentlemen are segregated, except for the two closed meetings, which are held on Wednesday evening and Sunday afternoon. Those are led by regularly selected meeting leaders, and at those meetings, of course, all the patients who are able to join in. It's an excellent thing because it gives them their first indoctrination and orientation, and when they leave with their sponsor and go to a meeting, it isn't as if this was a strange program that they're going into. No television is permitted on the floor. Now, they think that's because I am so chinchy that I won't put one there. <laughs> but that is an AA rule, and I must say it's a very good one. The boys can play cards, they can listen to the radio. But it's a very difficult thing for a sponsor to come to visit a patient when the Yanks are playing the Cleveland Indians at the Yankee Stadium broadcast on television. I know if I were AA, I'd have to be awfully, awfully strong-minded to resist looking at, at least at an inning or two. Now, one other item on the AA floor, because, they, of course, in running a hospital like this, if I, could, if I had three hours, I could probably keep you laughing over the funny things that happen. We have a great advantage on that floor that these patients have, oh, except for a fractional percentage, have never been in the hospital before. Whatever the nurse hands them out in the way of medicine, they take. <laughs> Not upstairs, but on that floor they do. Upstairs, the old-timers, they won't take this and they won't take that, and their invariable phrase is, now look, Colonel, you know my case. I can't do this and I can't do that. One of the most important medicines they don't take because it interferes with their looking at television. But uh, a maverick, uh, I'll have to... Uh, <laughs> where's the last? Where's the last there? <laughs> No, no. Oh, I beg your pardon. It's Belladonna. It's nothing else than that. <laughs> I'm sorry I was so slow on the uptake. Now you see, now you see what type of minds make. Uh... About 12 years ago, about 12 years ago, uh, the squib people came to us. I'm going to tell this as a little story because it's so funny. And they asked us to try out a preparation of mephenazine, which they marked it under the name of Talserol, as a central muscular depressant and relaxant. And so we did. Well, it was first delivered to us in the most vile tasting stuff I ever tasted in my life. So they sent little bottles of cherry flavoring along, which we put in this. And... Uh, the doctors didn't know how much to give, so we figured an ounce would be all right. We gave an ounce to several fellows, and it was just as if they'd turned a spaghetti and they went flat on the floor, so we cut it down. <laughs> but we couldn't keep this cherry flavoring in suspension. So Squibb said, we'll make an elixir out of it. Well, happy days for Towns Hospital. The elixir had 20% alcohol. <laughs> And 
And you would be surprised how many fellas needed relaxing just before lunch and dinner. So when AA came in, I said, look, we're not going to do two things I don't want to fill. One is Coca-Cola and the other is Talsraw because these fellas want to drink coffee and Coca-Cola and say, look, I can't sleep. I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't sleep. Five bottles of Coke and four cups of coffee. <laughs> and Talsarol, they agreed with me on. And everything went fine until I say this maverick landed in there who had been on the upper floor. And he said, the nurse, where's my pink lady? <laughs> and uh, she said, we don't serve them on this floor. The first thing you know, I have to go up to Duffy's Tavern and here's an indignation meeting. We're paying our money here. Why can't we get this pink lady? These are the boys who've never heard of it before. And it took a little bit, bit of persuading but I was glad to get that lad off the floor because he knew too many answers. <laughs> now, the um, I've made some observations here, and I want to repeat my opening statement that what I say is applied to my private hospital and I would say other private hospitals that were holding out their facilities for the treatment of alcoholic patients. I don't think that facilities whose main work is mental should treat alcoholic patients. Or I don't think alcoholic patients would be treated in those facilities even if uh, physically they are separated from the mental patients because the attitude of the staff handling a predominance of mental cases must be uh, to regard anyone there as a variety or as a variant of mental cases. Now, you can't do that with alcoholics because they aren't mental cases. And I've talked with many a lad who has been hospitalized in various parts of the United States where the facilities are generally mild mental cases, alcoholic and drug addiction. And they've told me that the locking of the doors and the twanging of the bars and the, and the uh, orderlies walking around, you know, ready to restrain them in case they kick up a little bit, and they kick up all right. We call our kick-ups clam bakes, and our clam bakes generally start in the evening. The day is peaceful, but the clam bake starts in the evening. Another thing is that, and this I want to impress on you, and I don't want to be, uh, to uh, treat it lightly, and that is a subject which um, is very, very serious one for any of you concerned with alcoholics and their welfare. We have noticed the most dramatic and very sadly dramatic change in the condition of patients coming to us for treatment in the last seven or eight years. In the early days, as one fellow put it, a drunk was a drunk and a dope was a dope and three cheers. But it isn't that way now. We are using medications. True, they're not terribly new medications, but we're using medications in quantity than in so course day we never even had in the hospital. We are, must be prepared in receiving patients today to cope with prior medication before they come in, ranging ever, anywhere from chloral hydrate to morphine. And in between, we have the barbiturates, we have peraldehyde, and we have tranquilizers. I think I should probably write a testimony of thanks to every pharmaceutical firm that's putting out tranquilizers because he certainly is doing my business an awful lot of good. <laughs> now, the, we have to recognize, <clears throat> we have to recognize one important thing, or two things. One is logistical, thank you, one is logistical and the other is factual. There are certain people who are prone to an addiction. They may go through life without being exposed to narcotic drugs or pills or alcohol, and they may die happy, the fact they're never addicted to anything. But if you ever expose them to it, and if they take these drugs, and I'm speaking of the non-narcotic drugs now, to relieve them <clears throat> from either the aftermath and the tensions of dissipation, or the tensions created probably by unwise habits such as excessive smoking, and coffee drinking, they are very apt to become addicted to the new drug. And the use of these drugs in excess are much more deteriorative, much more dangerous, and uh, harmful than certainly their 
alcohol was. In fact, I told one fellow, he wasn't on the AA floor, so I haven't broken any faith with you. I said, if you have to get drunk twice a year, get drunk twice a year. For heaven's sake, but leave pills alone. Because he's beginning to get that awful fear that it generates in the user that if he doesn't have it, he's going to have convulsions or he's going to go into delirium tremens or he's going to have something terrible is going to happen to him. And I can't, I can say truthfully that we're not fanatical on any subject except warning our patients against the dangers of these drugs. And as you know, there's a great brotherhood of alcoholics. There's an interchange of information today that didn't exist 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And one fellow says to another one, I tried the best darn pill my doctor gave me. When I began to, when I had a hangover, I snapped out of it like that. That's for him. And we see, of course, the really sad results. Now may I, I've had my warning red light here. I like to close, of course, and this is not meant to be perfunctory, in thanking you for according me the privilege of appearing before you. I will say that we have learned more about our own work in dealing with the, al uh, the alcoholics referred by Alcoholics Anonymous because we have them in a better control situation than our own patients who take the liberties they think they are entitled to. And I can assure you that we regard it as a great duty, a great obligation, and an obligation well performed where we can help and start them on what we consider is the only sensible program that will ever assure them of continuing sobriety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel. I understand now why in certain irreverent circles in New York they refer to your institution as Towns Hospital. <laughs> All of us believe that we're here today, as it's so frequently expressed in our meetings, thanks to the grace of God in AA. Most of us learn about the grace of God through experience with someone who has known of it and who is able to mediate it to us. The entire movement has come to know of the grace of God as it has been mediated to us, expressed to us in tangible form by our next, next speaker. I look forward to this opportunity of chairing the meeting because it would give me an opportunity to meet her. And I'm very happy that she has been able to come to the coast and be with us this afternoon so that you may feel and come to know the sweetness of her spirit, the depth of her concern, and the effectiveness of her service to suffering alcoholics. Sister Ignatius. Chairman, and uh, many of my good friends, in fact, I feel Alcoholics Anonymous is part of my family, really. I um, know that God works in mysterious ways. How little I thought when I entered the convent that I would spend my days, at least as many of them as I have, in caring for alcoholics. But God works in mysterious ways, and certainly his divine providence has directed all this. I feel he can use very weak instruments to carry out his designs. But uh, in our vantage point, as I know Colonel Towns would say, you see many wonderful results. Nothing short of miracles. We are not uh, <clears throat> given to a lot of imaginary things, but certainly God 
is extremely kind to the alcoholic. Because a contrite and humble heart, he'll never, never uh, refuse to help and give him the grace he needs. I feel that uh, it's a privilege to work in this field. I owe much to my community. I, when Bill called me about this, I certainly could hardly think of appearing on a program like this. And as I said, well, it's something like the AA third step. We turn our life and our will over to God under the direction of our superior. My superiors might have sent word at any time that I was to take no more. It came nearly that, nearly to that point in a few cases. But thank God, in the fervent prayers of, well, I suppose many of the sisters who were interested, and our beloved Dr. Bob and Bill himself, somehow we weathered it through. I'll just, uh, Bill asked me to say a few words about how we got started in Akron. <clears throat> I hardly know myself. I was sent there in 1928, just as a, well, it might be the doctor recommended occupational therapy, change of occupation for a while. I was in the field of music, and as you know, that's rather nerve-wracking. And uh, <laughs> they thought that probably a change might uh, be good for me. So... Uh, I was sent uh, to St. Thomas, which was just opened in 1928, and it was there I met Dr. Bob. We had an open staff the first year because we didn't know the men, nor did they know us. Doctor operated at our hospital and the other hospitals. I didn't know they had a drinking problem, and in fact, I wouldn't have known it had he not told me so, because he didn't come to the hospital when he was drinking. Evidently. Oh, I can recall uh, sometimes his voice was rather reverberating. I could, <laughs> I could hear him when he came in the back door. He had a decided uh, English accent, I mean New England accent. But I somehow I liked him because he was stro- so straightforward. Those of us working around the hospitals know that some doctors... Uh, Make everything an emergency, a matter of life or death. Others will tell you the exact truth about the case. Say, well, my patient can wait a few days, or if they can't, then you know that you take them for what they say. However, doctor was so straightforward that I enjoyed working with him. And one day he told, he looked rather uh, down. We often had little chats. And um, this uh, morning he came and he looked rather down. I said, Doctor, what's the trouble this morning? Well, then he told me. He said, well, Sister, he said, I might as well tell you that um, uh, I came in contact with a New York broker and uh, he said, I've had a drinking problem for a long time. And somehow we got together and we've all tried to work out something that will help these drunks, he said. Well, <clears throat> he said, we've uh, been trying it out. They tried a few rest homes, and um, he had some in the other hospitals. And he said, Sister, would you consider taking one? Well, I hesitated because... Sometime before, oh, probably some months before, I took a man in who, oh, he looked, um, I didn't, I didn't know much about this drinking. I knew some could drink, I think some could drink and handle it well, and others couldn't. So, uh, as they called me to the emergency, and I went down and talked with him. Oh, he said, sister, I could just lie down a little while. He worked at the city garage and looked like a very respectable person. He said, I've been drinking a little too much and I want to get straightened up, which I thought was a good thing. 
Well, the only bed that uh, we had at the time was a bed in a four-bedroom. Then we knew nothing about uh, special treatment. And uh, I signed him to the man on service, on medical service, and registered him, put him to bed, and I said, you won't cause any trouble. Oh, no, he'd be an angel. (laughs) Well, I forgot about him. When I came over early the next morning, the night supervisor, who was tall, sister, we always teased her about her big feet. Well, she was standing at the door waiting for me. She said, the next time you take a DT in this place, please stay up all night and run around after him as we have. <laughs> mm. That wasn't the end of it either. I decided then that that's enough. I often felt sorry to see them turned away, but I was not the last word in the hospital. So when doctor proposed my taking a real look, as I thought a real thing. <laughs> well, you can imagine my misgivings. I thought, oh, dear me. I, I told him about this experience, and I said, Doctor, uh, not only will I be put out, but I said, the patient and everything else. I said, I don't think they want alcoholics. So he said, Sister, this patient won't give you a bit of trouble because I will, I will medicate him, I'll assure you. Well, I had much confidence in him because he never said anything that wasn't so. I'll always say that. Well, very fearfully, I said, well, doctor, I shall take him then. And put him in a two-bedroom. I thought I was doing pretty well because we were so crowded in those days. And uh, beds were at rather premium. So I took him to this two-bedroom. Doctor, pardon me, doctor went up and medicated him and everything. And I thought, well, I figured I wouldn't hear much till the next morning anyway if there was any trouble. So well, there was a word about it. Doctor then came to the admitting office. He said, Sister, would you mind putting my patient in a private room? I thought I had done pretty good to put him in a two bed. <laughs> He said, you know, they, he said there'd be some men come to visit him, and they like to talk to him privately. Well, I uh, said, I'll do what I can, doctor. After he left, I went up and looked the situation over. And right across the hall, we had a flower room where we used to prepare the patient's flowers. And I thought, well, they can fix their flowers somewhere else for today, and I believe I could push the bed in there. (laughs) That's what we did. And his visitors came. We kept a close eye on them. (laughs) I did. (laughs) It was all you. And I thought, oh, am I the respectable-looking men? They don't look as though they ever took a drink. And uh, went along. I thought, now the next time, I won't have this trouble. I'll put him in a private room. So the next one that came along, I put in a private room. And uh, he uh, seemed, I didn't know much about these alcoholics. I was not an expert, surely. The Lord picked out a, a weakling when he picked out me, I know. But... Um, However, I took him down to the room, as I would any patient, and then was taking the chart to the desk to explain to the nurse a little about it. I couldn't tell her too much, but said Dr. Bob would uh, would give her the orders. And wasn't he down after me? <laughs> well, he had his short on and everything else. And <laughs> I nearly went through the floor because the nurses all looked and everyone. And I said, you go right back to your room, we'll be right down. So the nurse came down with me. And here he was under the bed. <laughs> well, I thought this will never work. I don't believe this will go at all. 
I'd better put two together the next time. I didn't want to give up at once. I don't know just exactly what I did, whether I uh, had someone stay with them or what I did. But I know after that, I put them, uh, put two together, and then finally we took a four-bedroom. That seemed to go pretty good. One would help the other. Usually, one or two would be in a few days before they'd be coming out of it pretty well. And uh, so then we took another two-bed across the hall. Well, it was hard to say no when they really wanted to do something about it. And But that time, the men were coming in quite often, so much so that some of the sisters said, who are these fine-looking men that come in so often and seem so interested in the patients? And uh, I didn't say much at first, but I later I said, well, that is AA. I said, what is AA? Would you like to know something about it? Well, yes. Well, I'll bring some literature. <laughs> That's how I gradually got them. But, of course, before that, a committee from Alcoholics Anonymous talked with Sister Superior. She was one who'd had a lot of experience in the old days of charity and all. And uh, she knew what we were doing. And she said uh, to these men, she said, well, uh, strange, she said, when we had them at charity, they'd be running around the halls and doing a lot of trouble. But since Dr. Bob is treating them, we don't know that they're in the house. So she said, there's no problem. As far as I can see, just go right along. Well, that was wonderful. But that wasn't all, of course. Then later patients uh, complained because they couldn't have visitors at any time, as these AAs did. They seemed like such privileged characters. <laughs> and, uh, so finally, they decided to... We had a small accident ward. It was sort of off from the rest of the uh, hospital. And there we put in a coffee bar, and Dr. Bob set up the program. I uh, want to tell you that the first opportunity he had, he brought Bill over. And, uh, of course, I couldn't imagine who this wonderful Bill was. But I soon learned that... uh, God had chosen two great men. What one didn't have, the other supplemented. And together, they were perfect. I could just see, I often say to our boys, had God picked up two great religious leaders, no one would have come near them. Because the alcoholic doesn't want anything about religion or God, nor do we try to preach religion to them. But they aren't in a very long until they're asking or telling you what experience they've had and what they'd like to do. They know they haven't been living right. And I feel that, as many of our nurses have said, the best sedative is peace of mind. If once they can be relieved of their anxieties and worries and treated properly, there should be no trouble. First, when they first come in and... uh, Dr. Bob set up the program. No televisions, no radios, no newspapers. Only literature pertaining to AA or something that would have a a moral, I mean a building of their morals and things of that kind. Because they don't, they have all the reading they can take care of and then their visitors too. Well, we went on with that. There's, there are many details I could bring in, but I don't want to make it too long because I... Now, many of you have probably questions that maybe Colonel Towns could answer and some of these people who know much more than I. But anyway, during doctor's time, I think we treated before between four and 5,000. And he treated them. He came in every day unless he was out of town or something like that. And... Uh, without any charge. He said, that's my contribution to AA. Of course, in those days, they didn't have too much either to start with. And you couldn't mention money very well or how much it would cost because if we just get them sober, it would mean a great deal. But that was taken care of later on. Thank God. It worked out very well. And they are no problem 
Oh, many times, whether they have it or don't, we take them in because God certainly provides. And the man who gets his program is everlastingly grateful. Doctor, um, it was hard to understand. Sometimes he'd make rounds and he'd come down and he'd say, Sister, let that man go home. He doesn't want this program. Oh, but Doctor has a big family and he has this pet meal. Doesn't want the program, Sister. He isn't ready. So he was always right. Many times they'd frighten me, you know, so they'd have a heart attack, or they would tell me they had a bad heart or something. And I hated to bother Doctor too much. Often I'd call Anne. I think members of this group, or any alcoholic, should often say a prayer for Anne, because she was the backbone of this. In her calm, quiet way, she was really an angel. I would call her and say, oh, Anne, I'm so worried about this fellow. She knew most of them from either reputation or doctor telling about them. And uh, she would get the doctor if it was anything serious, but otherwise she'd not. Don't worry about it. Because, well, they have a, they have a, um, they're alibiologists, in other words. <laughs> and I learned they were. <laughs> they do anything to uh, promote another drink or treatment of some kind. So, well, uh, we take them but once. That was doctor's plan, too. I thought, oh, my. That's kind of strict, isn't it? But, oh, I see the wisdom of it. Because if there is a merry-go-round, when that temptation comes, you want to think, well, I can get back in there for five or six days. Well, that'll be all right. Sister's good. She'll take me back. And I'd only be encouraging my drinking. They know that it's a one-way trip. The sponsors, and this uh, Colonel Town said they are, their cooperation is tremendous. Any hospital who tries to just take them in on their own is very foolish because they need the sponsorship. I often say it's something like learning the technique of golf. You may know all the angles and all the rules, but unless you get out there in the field and do some footwork, and practice, you won't be much of a golfer. So we tried, Dr. Felt, if they could be take, taken out of their environment. At first, it was just five days because people were pretty depleted after the depression and all, and financially. And uh, the sooner we got them back to their family, the better. Although many of those first AAs would take them into their own homes and try to help indoctrinate them. They worked in groups. It was marvelous what they did. But however, we uh, certainly have uh, uh, found that it was very wise because a sponsor will not bring them until they are ready. And then we he screens them carefully and goes over it. We want to be sure the sponsor is not just a person they met in a bar somewhere. Uh, but uh, one, I usually have some foot groups are attending. Of course, now I know most of them well, know who are good sponsors and who are not. But it's a tremendous help. So finally, <clears throat> we, um, um, the time came. Well, uh, Anne, of course, died in 49. And uh, that... Uh, was very hard for doctor. He called from the Cleveland airport. They had just gotten in from Texas, and the plane was grounded. It wasn't Bill. Bill knows more about this than I. Anyway, they brought it directly to the hospital, and we kept doctor there too, because he was pretty well shaken up with all this, and Anne died of pneumonia and all that. So uh, went on from there, doctor. Then died in 1950, a year and a half later. He knew then, I believe, that he had a malignancy. He had uh, talked with Bill, well, I think that several times a week, if not every other day, he'd give me a little message. And uh, I felt as though 
<clears throat> I knew Bill and his guiding spirit, too, because there wasn't very much done that they didn't consult together on, especially anything affecting this, the foundation of this. Then uh, one day I got word, we're just like people in the Army, you know, we go to where we're sent. I often wondered whether I was off the mailing list or whether I was forgotten. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was there for uh, 24 years, probably one week short of 24 years. And uh, finally, the obedience came that I was to go to charity and uh, work with AA there. They had had AA at charity and fine workers there. But they just had a small department. And Sister Victorine, a very fine sister, who everybody loved, was there too. And she came down and we told her everything and Dr. Bob talked with her. And she really did a good job. But uh, they decided to build a new wing and all the extra. Oh, I know they thought uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was a frill then or not, but uh, Everything was discontinued. It wasn't absolutely a case of life or death. So they <clears throat> just kind of forgot about AA. But Reverend Mother didn't. She saw much good in it, I know. I went there in August, and I didn't hear a word about, other than on my obedience, it said uh, that I was to take care of this floor and uh, visit these patients and work with AA. Well, I knew someday maybe we'd have them. But anyway, I just observed and went along day by day. Finally, one day, I got a call. I was in the surgery checking on the patient to see and find out the condition. And we were worried about this patient, and the bell rang furiously and said, Superior wants you. She's on your floor. And I came down, and the architect of the new building was there, and... Um, a few nurses, uh, the director of our nursing service was there, and uh, of course, uh, Superior said, what kind of a setup would you like for this AA? Well, you can imagine standing in the middle of the floor and feeling rather strange. I didn't know whether I was at home myself or not just yet, and I uh, couldn't think very fast. So this nurse uh, said, uh, well, sister, are they violent? I said, no, they're not violent. Oh, they're not intoxicated. Yes, they are intoxicated. <laughs> but they're clear enough to be screened because we must make sure that they want the person. Well, she said to the architect, you won't need those cages then. <laughs> well, I said... I said to Mr. Rockin, would you mind, give me a few days and we'll drop a little plan of what we'd like. Fine. Well, the day that they came was on the feast of our Lady of the Rosary. That's how we call it, Rosary Hall. And there is, uh, connected with that, when I was moved there, I thought, oh, I'd love to have this in memory of Dr. Bob. Well, I thought if I get permission, rather than call it the Alcoholic Ward, we'll call it Rosary Hall. And I was thinking of marking their robes, R.H., well, I thought all I need is a nest, and I have doctor's initials, R.H.S., Robert Holbrook Smith. So we call it Rosier Hall Solarium. <laughs> insignia on the door is R.H.S. Permission to open the ward is granted by a hospital, the hospital authorities on October the 7th. 1952, Peace of the Most Holy Rosary. I feel that to people, whether they're in the church or uh, whatever their denomination, when you see a rosary, you know it means prayer. People get the rosary out, well, you think they're praying somehow. So to everyone, I think this is all a result of someone's prayer. The grace of God comes through someone's prayer and penance, that's for sure. Well, anyway, the... Uh, is it there for the name Rosary Hall, Solarium? Well, I told you about that. 
The insignia eloquently expresses the efforts of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, a Catholic religious order, as they join forces with the members of AA, a strictly non-sectarian movement, in an attempt to rescue men and women of all creeds from the bottomless pit of alcoholism. To be admitted to this ward, you must be sponsored by a member of AA in good standing. You must also evidence a desire not just to get sober, but also preserve and perpetuate your sobriety on a day-by-day basis. Unless you yourself are willing to admit that you are an alcoholic, you are advised to seek help elsewhere. The physical therapy is most modern known to medical science. The patient's entire stay is a retirement from the outside world and the habits which has, have caused his collapse. There are no radios, televisions, um, newspapers, or magazines. Nothing but AA literature and other literature in keeping with the programs are available. The patient may have no visitors except members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are welcome between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. The conversation is turned to alcoholism and its ravaging problems. Every evening, a member of AA comes to the hospital to conduct a brief AA meeting for the patients. An attractive coffee bar stands in the center of the hall where AA members and the patients often gather to discuss their common problems. A little oratory is open at all times. Just if they want to do some prayerful thinking, it's there. The remodeling and construction work for the solarium was done by members of AA who contributed their time and money. Members who belonged to the building trades worked day and night during these spare hours to complete the lovely quarters at no cost to the hospital. Rosary Hall accepted its first patient one year ago, and since that date, 1,000 men and women have been hospitalized therein. We have much room for women. We're hoping to get more. Oh, we... Have three, we, as usually we have three, sometimes four, and even it's stretched to five, but that isn't good. However, uh, the remodel of Rosary Hall accepted his first patient one year ago, and since that day, well, pardon me for repeating, they have been offered not only the key to sobriety, but also the key to a happy sobriety. The Sisters of Charity and the members of Alcoholics Anonymous who have assisted them that decline any individual credit. They are aware that it is in giving we receive. Well, God bless you all, and I wish you a continued happy sobriety. And uh, may God's grace be with you always and bless every one of you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.